uh, it's my honor to, uh, to present our uh, 67th um, annual Abbott uh, professor, Dr. Andy Schmidt. You've heard some of the things that I've, uh, I'm gonna say about him already, but I think it's worth uh, emphasizing just uh, so we all appreciate how lucky we are to have you here, Andy. And he's a professor at the University of, uh, of Minnesota Medical School. He's chaired the Department of Orthopedic Surgery at Hennepin since uh, 2014. On a national and global level, he has advanced faculty and student education that's helped shape clinical practice. Dr. Schmidt's clinical expertise, as you've already uh, uh, heard um, in some of the discussions that we had, focuses on musculoskeletal trauma and uh, adult reconstruction surgery as research centers on acute compartment syndrome, prevention of musculoskeletal infections, periprosthetic fractures, and hip fractures. His scientific findings have been published widely internationally and has lectured throughout the world. Andy currently serves as the chair of the AOS Education Council, providing oversight and decision-making on the Academy's educational Portfolio Dr. Schmidt is past president of the Orthopedic Trauma Association and has chaired uh, the former Extremity War Injuries uh, uh, Symposium and the AOS Annual uh, uh, Meeting Committee. Uh, he's dedicated to advancing uh, orthopedic science. He also serves as a peer reviewer for multiple um, journals that you've probably heard of. Uh, he is deputy, de deputy editor now of the uh, OTA International Journal. On a personal level, Andy's a humble and, and gracious colleague. I've always known Andy as a selfless leader and a friend to myself and our department. Um, you may not know that Andy is an avid climber. He told me uh, that he was recently on a climb in the Dolomites and crossed paths with uh, Alex Honnold and, and, and Jimmy Chin, and, and he tried to contain his excitement and, quote, keep it cool. Well, I think if those guys knew that they were in the presence of the 67th uh, Abbott professor, that they would have definitely asked to put you in their next movie. Um, please join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Uh, Schmidt um, as our 67th annual Abbott professor. Thank, thank you, Sam. Um, I want to thank the department leadership and uh, the course organizers and, and all of you for the opportunity to be here and participate and hopefully contribute to this wonderful symposium. As I said yesterday, I, I feel a real kinship between um, our program and, and the San Francisco program. And from someone kind of on, on the periphery watching what you all have done, it's just incredibly impressive. And you have a, an incredible thing here. So keep doing what you're doing. Um, I'm going to talk about something that's um, of interest to me. And I don't see the clicker up here. Sorry about that. Um, which is surgical decision making and uh, per performance improvement in trauma. So I have some um, financial conflicts, but none of which are going to be pertinent to this topic. So what I want to do is talk about surgical safety in the context of a specialty in which we care for patients in these incredibly complex, chaotic, and unpredictable systems. I want to talk about the concept of cognitive heuristics and our, our biases that inform and sometimes impair our decision making and how we can be aware of that talk about the problem of variation in surgical care and outcomes, and then at the end review some simple tools that may uh, help uh, reduce error. So um, we all know about error in, in medicine. Uh, the, the health policy makers and the public, I think, really became aware of it back when this publication from the Institute of Medicine was published in, in 2000, documenting the tremendous cost and, and, um, um, in medical error in our healthcare system. In surgery, uh, medical errors are certainly overrepresented. Um, one in 10 hospital patients overall uh, experiences an adverse uh, event of some sort, but surgery is dramatically overrepresented in those outcomes. And in fact, about two thirds of them are associated with a surgical provider of some sort. Worldwide, well over 200 million surgeries are done. Probably at least a million patients in the world die after surgery each year um, from surgical complications. And the costs of this worldwide are absolutely staggering. So performance improvement is many things. It's, it's certainly the dramatic, trying to reduce those uh, mortality and morbidity from surgery, but um, we also want to optimize patient outcomes. Um, it, it's avoiding waste and inefficiency in care. And I know with Dr. Bozic's influence here, and you all know about value and you know, quality over cost. And so anything that's going to in influence either of those parameters is something that we want to do our best on improving. So I'm going to start with something that's 
incredibly mundane, which is just the problem of surgical first case starts. So I found this paper um, describing over almost 6,000 cases in a single healthcare system, and 88% of the first case starts were delayed. The authors tried to find out why. So they kind of blamed it on the patient. It seemed that nearly two thirds of it, uh, two thirds of the time, the patient was late to surgery, and I think the analysis kind of stops there. But there's a fascinating editorial that accompanies this article, talking about how complex me medical organizations are. The processes are complex, dynamic, potentially fragile uh, systems. They tend to get even more complicated as, as time goes by. And so even the difficulty of predicting something so simple as when patients are going to arrive for surgery becomes impossible. And he describes a, a very commonplace clinical scenario of a person coming in for same-day surgery, has to be driven by her daughter. One of the kids was fussy, and she was five to ten minutes late leaving the house. Then there was a car accident that backed up the freeway, and she added an, another ten minutes. And then the valet parking you know, is backed up because one of the attendants called in sick, and then they come to register, and the uh, attendant is being asked questions by someone else. And then uh, because she was late, they were checking in people that were actually following her in surgery, but she had to wait for them, and it just, it just goes on and on, and you know, the initial five to 10 minute delay <laughs> that might have been all it was, compounds and compounds, and, and suddenly it's, a, it's an hour long delay. So that's just a commonplace example that we can all understand, but it gets to this concept of chaos theory, which is something I've been interested in, and yes, chaos theory is abandoned in New England, it's also in New England IPA, <laughs> but it's a, it's a branch of science as well that's absolutely fascinating. Um, to learn about, and, and my interest in this began when I read this book by James Gleick, which was published over 20 years ago, and I'd recommend this to anyone who has even a potentially passing interest in this, because it's very easy to read and, and understand, and, and frankly, quite, quite eye-opening. So I told Dr. Fowler I was going to show some mathematical, or uh, Dr. Yuna was going to show some mathematical equations, so here they are. So um, complexity science talks about things that are, that are deterministic. There's an equation, but in this case, the equation doesn't have one answer. It predicts um, or at least to things that, that um, are sort of unpredictable. Uh, these equations are behind fractals, which is those beautiful images that you see in the top. What's interesting about those is you can zoom in and zoom out to any scale that you want and actually look the same. So that's, a, that's an interesting topic. But um, these are essentially these dynamic uh, systems in which the outcome is dramatically dependent on initial events. And um, some of the initial researchers in this area talked about, for example, the weather, the stock market, um, as examples of these sort of complex systems that are uh, very susceptible to small influences having very large effects down the road. Uh, there's a lot of papers about the issue of complexity in healthcare. This is just one. Uh, this article points out that, in general, a complex adaptive system is any collection of individual agents, uh, that could be anything, that act in, uh, independent of one another in ways that are not always predictable but whose actions are interconnected so that any one agent's actions changes the outcome and gives examples, and at the bottom you can see um, any collection of humans is included in this, including a healthcare team. So surgical care ob obviously requires a team of people to, um, to accomplish. Uh, our knowledge base is ever-changing, um, which makes things complicated. i show something kind of funny on that in a minute. Um, we often, or almost always, make decisions based on incomplete information, um, and as surgeons, our decisions are, are very biased. And, and often based on these unconscious decision rules, these heuristics that we use. And we heard some examples this morning, the concept of anchoring, for example. So this is a funny paper I came across about how it's impossible to be an, an expert in, in, in medicine. So this article happens to be about echocardiography. It was, this article was written in 2010. At that time, there were 113,000 papers published in Medline on this particular topic. So if you read five papers an hour, eight hours a day, five days a week, 50 weeks a year, <laughs> Um, it would take you 11 years and 24, 124 days to read those papers, during which time another 82,000 papers would be published. And you know, 41 years later, you'd finally be, be caught up in the literature. So I think this is true certainly for, for orthopedics probably as well. So in medicine, we, we, make, um, we have to process this information and make decisions that are associated with unpredictable outcomes. And even if we do the same thing every time, we know our patients um, have their own variables that they uh, inject into the equation. Uh, but furthermore, we often have information that's incomplete. These are three fascinating books that, that I've read. I know Sam has talked about the Thinking Fast and Slow. Um, uh, Michael Lewis is one of my favorite authors, and his book, The Undoing Project, actually talks about some of the work by Kahneman. Then the most recent uh, book um, up regarding noise and decision-making, which is fascinating in its own right. So 
it's helpful to be aware of our kind of our the imperfections in our thought processes. And there's something called counterfactual thinking, which physicians are incredibly prone to. And we know this among ourselves. If we have a complication, even if we did things correctly, we're going to change it next time. You know, so if we have a, a patient with a particular problem and a four or five choices we can make, make or maybe even more, probably one of those choices is associated with the highest probability of a good outcome. And that's clearly the choice that we should make. But every so often, we're going to make that choice and the outcome isn't what we uh, wanted. But when we're faced with that same situation again, we should make the same choice. But we don't. We remember that last case. And conversely, we could be making poor outcomes and kind of getting, or, or making poor decisions and happily or luckily getting, getting good outcomes and we keep on making the wrong decision every time. So this is called counterfactual thinking. These authors report a, a test where they can kind of look for this. And, and, and physicians, they did 60 sort of trials of decision making, the physicians demonstrated this half the time, this counterfactual thinking. So um, we're not the best decision makers. And that gets into these biases and, and decision making heuristics that we use. And so this is just a kind of a fun example. You know, if, if you read horizontally, you're going to see ABC, but if you read vertically, you're going to see 12, 13, 14. And so your perspective is, is very important. And these are just examples of some of these heuristics. So confirmation bias, I think you all know of. An anchoring was mentioned this morning. You present someone a high number, they're going to start, th their thinking is going to be along that line if you present someone a low number. And they don't even have to be related. You can just ask, show someone a, you know, an ace in a deck of cards and have them make a decision. And if they think an ace is good, they'll, <laughs> they'll, they'll, um, it'll bias their next decision. Uh, what you see is all there is is something that Kahneman talks about in his books, um, that biases are, are decision making and concepts like representativeness and prospect theory where we make decisions maybe trying to um, uh, prevent regret on our part is something that's, that's uh, important. So this is a fascinating article. Dave Ring is one, probably one of the senior authors, Robert Prezian. Um, this talks about how these things can affect our thinking in orthopedic surgery. So misjudgment of probability, we're actually really poor at judging the likelihood of various things. Um, we don't consider base rates. So I talk a lot about compartment syndrome and we all know the the six P's or however many P's there are, but that has, a, a patient can have all, all, all of those present, but the actual diagnostic implication of that is completely different, depending on if you're talking about someone with a segmental tibia fracture or someone who just um, you know, played in a soccer game and came into the urgent care center without, even without an injury. So we don't consider base rates when we make decisions. That's the, that's the premise of Bayesian analysis that we're not very good at. We, uh, have confirmation bias, so we pay attention to things that confirm what we already think and ignore things that don't. We have a preference for certainty and anchoring and framing as well. And in this paper, which I encourage everyone to look at, they had 196 surgeons review several vignettes uh, highlight, are designed to highlight some of these potential biases, and they found that, again, about half the time uh, th those uh, surgeons made decisions based on some of these cognitive biases. So this comes into play, for example, in treating fractures like this. Obviously, these are controversial. We had some uh, discussion of some of the controversies yesterday and throughout, throughout talks uh, in, in, in this meeting. Um, and, and we do a poor job of giving patients what they want. So this is another interesting editorial regarding patients with femoral neck fractures. And if you really have a uh, discussion with patients and they uh, can think about it they, and you review all the options, um, the majority of them prefer total hip replacement. You know, this, this paper was, this editorial was based on a paper that showed that 93% of the time they actually got a hemiarthroplasty. So we're not giving our patients necessarily what they want, and it has to do with a lot of different factors. But obviously a proper decision is going to be um, based not only on properly estimating the likelihood of, of success, the outcomes, and the probability of complications like dislocation or revision, for example, but we've got to define what those mean for each particular patient and come up with a you know, positive or negative utility and describe that to the patient in the way that he or she can understand. And there's other things like life expectancy and such that uh, influence this as well. Um, and this is kind of funny um, to, or scary to learn about too, but surgeons, um, and you know, orthopedic surgeons are primarily male. Uh, that's changing happily. But a third of surgeons demonstrated dangerous lay dangerously high um, level of what's called a hazardous uh, attitude, or what's often referred to as sort of macho decision making. So hopefully I have a funny video that sort of demonstrates that in a, in a non-surgical uh, field. The Oregon State Highway Division not only had a whale of a problem on its hands, it had a stinking whale of a problem. Observation. 
Well, I'm confident that it'll work. The only thing is we're not sure just exactly how much uh, explosives it'll take to disintegrate this. parked car over a quarter of a mile from the blast site was the target of one large chunk, the passenger compartment literally. It might be concluded that should a whale ever wash ashore in Lane County again, those in charge will not only remember what to do, they'll certainly remember what not to do. So this, this happened in Oregon about 50 years ago. That was, the, uh, that was an Oregon State Highway, you know, foreman or something who came up with a plan to blow up the whale. And, you know, it, his confidence was impressive and maybe a little misguided, but uh, you know, I think that's an example, I guess, of this sort of hazardous decision making. Um, so our attitude certainly influences how we make decisions, and, um, but also the system-wide um, pers personality, if you will, and, and this really gets to institutional culture, which is uh, quite difficult to change. But the, the point I'm trying to make is we need to understand how we think. Um, we, need, we, we tend to search for patterns, we assign causation when we see patterns and relationships that may or may not be there. And we're also subject to something that's been referred to as in inintentional blindness. Um, so uh, here's an example that shows that we're, we're maybe not as smart as we think we are. This is a, a paper published in the Christmas issue of, of the British Medical Journal, which uh, should give you a hint of what's going to come. But um, in this article, two groups of raiders um, reviewed nine cases of proximal humerus fractures. These are real cases. They were in the Hanover Humerus Registry. And the raiders were asked to estimate the outcome with non-operative treatment. They were asked whether they would recommend operative or non-operative treatment. And if they recommended surgery, what surgery, uh, surgical approach would they uh, use? And in fact, all these patients were treated conservatively, so the, the outcome was actually known for the non-operative uh, pathway. And um, the raiders were given complete case presentations, demographics, radiographs, 3D CTs, um, uh, pre-injury quality of life uh, information. Um, and uh, so, Group one, um, when, when you talk about predicting the outcome of non-operative management, probably the, the fundamental question. Um, in group one, 4% um, of the predictions were correct, and in group two, nearly 30% of, of the of predictions were correct. So group one happened to be a group of, of experienced American and German trauma surgeons. Group two, the better group, was a bunch of macaque monkeys <laughs> who made their choices based on picking nuts out of one of the bases, the, base, uh, the uh, containers there. So. Uh, but this is this inintentional blindness. So this is a paper looking at radiology. So 24 radiologists were asked to perform a simple task of identifying a lung nodule on a CT scan, something they do all the time. Um, unbeknownst to the radiologists, a gorilla 48 times larger than the average nodule was inserted in the last case. And uh, if you can't see it, it's right there. 83% of the radiologists did not comment on the gorilla, even though eye tracking software showed that many of them looked right at it. So this is sort of a play on in the Invisible Gorilla book that some of you, or, or videos that some of you may have seen. Um, so how does this happen in orthopedics? Well, here's an example of, uh, I assume you all see the missed interlocking screws. So how does that happen? Well, that's inintentional blindness where those are placed through a jig. They're ne never supposed to miss. And what you're looking at is the femoral head and whether those screws are properly positioned in rotation and length and all those sort of things. So we're subject to all of this as our radiologists. Um, we do a lousy job, I think, of trying to, to Im improve performance and give feedback to each other. This is just something off of social media, so this is obviously Minnesota in the winter. Someone's complaining about someone leaving their dog in the car while they ran in the grocery store. Um, and these are all the comments, uh, which you can read for yourself. But when you read these comments, how often uh, have you heard this exact sort of exchange at an m and conference, you know, without a lot of really constructive um, processes that, that perhaps come out of that? And we talked quite a bit yesterday in the case presentations on shared decision making. Um, and this really gets into how you consent patients and this, these heuristics, again, of framing. Um, and so this has been demonstrated. If, if you tell a patient uh, that their complication rate is 12% is, uh, or their lack of complication rate is um, you know, 88%, they might make a different judgment from some of that framing and anchoring capabilities. So um, it's really important how we go about doing this. Um, and this is some of the data from that article, again, showing some of these sort of heuristics and, and how uh, information is delivered will affect um, the choice that a patient might make. And so again, with my compartment syndrome interest, the uh, 
that was one of the uh, uh, questions was how do you consent a patient for fasciotomy? And if you just explain things, they make one decision, but if you show them a photograph of claw toes and perhaps an amputation or something, they make another uh, choice. So just, again, more, more interesting information. So now I'll move on to this concept of variation in surgery. This is from the Dartmouth Medical At Atlas, and it basically just shows the proportion of fractures that are treated surgically. So it's not surprising that the, almost all the hip fractures are treated surgically, but vir virtually every other fracture that you see, femur, humeral shaft, distal humerus, ankle, forearm, there's all, they all have incredibly wide range in the number of patients in different Medicare uh, um, geographic places that are, that are treated um, surgically or not. So not all this variation is preventable. It's not necessarily bad, but variation in surgery is far, far too high, I think. Um, this is an interesting paper regarding variation in how humeral shaft fractures are treated, and not whether or not you use a lock plate or some sort of a nail or what, but just whether or not you even operate on them. Um, this paper looked at two cohorts of patients kind of before and after locking plates were introduced. So in the 1990 to 2000, um, using this Medicare data, you can see that actually this, this area of the country, San Jose and Alameda County, uh, California, had the highest rates of operative treatment, and there were lots of areas of the United States where none of these fractures were ever operated on. And um, in mid-2000s, after locking plates were introduced, they looked at it again, and overall the rate of surgical treatment dramatically increased, and there were hardly any regions of the country that didn't operate at all. But this just shows how you know, even the introduction of sort of an unproven, and what we now know to not necessarily be all that successful technology uh, changes um, um, surgical care and leads to some of this variation. So variation can be random, like you see on the left, or sort of focused or targeted um, on the right. And uh, when they all cluster together, like, like that drawing on the right shows, that implies that there's some sort of systematic bias or variability, something in processes that may be able to be corrected, but when you just have random variation like on the left, that's really hard to prevent. So this is a paper from this institution. Um, you see Dr. Bozik's name and Dr. Vale's name looking at influence of procedural volumes and, and standardization of care on the outcomes of total joint replacement surgery. And what they showed is that when you standardize processes, um, you have a much, uh, st that standardized processes do have a strong association with improved quality and efficiency of care, and that that's something important uh, to do to optimize value of uh, arthroplasty. And this, these effects are true regardless of the hospital or patient, uh, or surgeon volume, I should say. So how do you standardize care? Uh, that can be done institutionally, it can be done individually, um, but uh, clinical practice guidelines are sort of a system-wide way or, of uh, uh, trying, to, trying to optimize patient care. These are created by a formal process, uh, incorporating a rigorous systematic review of the literature, um, asking specific questions, and then um, trying to uh, assess the benefits and harms of, of different alternatives. So this is an example of how this can come to play uh, or how it could affect out outcomes of uh, uh, hip fracture surgery. So this is a paper reviewing uh, the use of echocardiography. So one of the biggest frustrations you have as a trauma surgeon and a hip fracture patient is when a surgery is delayed because the medicine service wants an echocardiogram and most often, as you know, that it gets, the patient gets cleared and you do the surgery you know, six or eight hours later. Um, so this paper looked at whether or not those echocardiograms were actually justified by clinical practice guidelines that the American Card College of Cardiology has um, come up with. And so when the ECHO was actually appropriate, meaning that it met the criteria of these guidelines. About a third of the time, there was a finding that w would affect how anesthesia might manage the patient perioperatively. But if the ECHO was not indicated on these guidelines, just because someone on the, on the medicine service wanted it, there was never a finding that really affected surgical care. So this is just an example of how a standardized process and decision making based, based on the uh, medical evidence can optimize care um, in hip fracture patients. This is another book of mine that's a, that's a favorite. Uh, Atul Gawande wrote this years ago, The Checklist Manifesto, and it's not just about medicine, it's about airline industry and uh, manufacturing, uh, construction industry. But he does say in this book that medicine has become so complex that it's really a test of whether any one person can actually master it. And so checklists are something very simple we all use all the time, but actually they're a fairly sophisticated example of, of systems engineering. Um, we, in trauma, we can apply checklists to how we grade fracture, fractures, in this example, hip fractures, and become much more uniform um, in our assessment of whether or not a fracture is healed. And you all have probably seen evidence of this being used. Um, it improves inter-radio agreement in, in literature, for sure. 
Um, but you all, I'm sure, have used this, this surgical safety checklist. This is something we certainly do at our hospital where you, you do a formal timeout, everybody pauses, and you run through the, the items on this checklist. And the reason we do this is because Dr. Gwandi and colleagues showed that, that when you do, you reduce not only morbidity but mortality, and this was studied worldwide, I think in eight hospitals around the world and published in the New England Journal. And this is not new, this is back in 2009, but this is the impetus of the World Health Organization checklist. But there are other, this is a paper showing that it also works in urgent uh, surgeries also worldwide. But there are other papers showing that these things don't have much of an effect. Um, the Canadian province of Ontario mandated the adoption of this checklist and looked at its outcome, uh, at the, whether or not care changed. And essentially, in Ontario, Canada, it was not associated with the same reductions in morbidity and mortality that they saw in the initial paper. Um, here in South Carolina, the state didn't mandate it, but they suggested that hospitals that wanted to do this should do it. And in the hospitals that did implement it, there was a benefit of care. So perhaps it's more the institutional culture about safety and whether they want to do something like this. And if the, if the institution is resistant, the, the checklists aren't going to matter. And that gets into the whole science of implementation um, theory, which I'm not going to get into. But this paper on this has a whole paragraph on the successes and failures of the surgical safety checklist, which is interesting to read. But in this paper, they found that the most common barrier were resistance from senior clinicians like me. So um, it's important for the doctors to, to buy into this and to show that we, we believe in it to, for it to be successful. And here's another paper showing that when you adopt a surgical safety checklist, it can actually prevent malpractice claims. This paper identified 294 um, malpractice claims and reviewed the records. 412 contributing factors were identified in those cases, and uh, nearly a third of them would have been intercepted and prevented had a checklist like we just talked about actually been used. So that's a, that's a fairly significant number, and importantly, 40% of the deaths would have been uh, prevented, perhaps. I think that one of the best examples of this sort of thing is what the uh, National Health Service in the United Kingdom has done with a lot of things, but in particular hip fracture care. They've come up with um, a set of standards for fracture care, the use of a hospitalist, time to surgery, antibiotics, many of the things we already know, but they, they wrote it down and, and mandated it from a National Health Service perspective. And th this is one of the clinical practice guidelines and, and a paper describing the impact of that in, in England. But they dramatically improved their complication rate, their length of stay, their outcomes, pretty much every parameter. And what they did that we could never do in the States was, was they actually have something called the best practice tariff. So hospitals, well, I shouldn't say we could never do it, but <laughs> it'd be unlikely probably would happen, but they pay the hospitals more, the government, when they, when they meet all these standards. And um, every year you can download the uh, National Infrastructure Database from the UK and you can look at things and they, they've shown how um, just their outcomes have improved over the years. And you can actually look up by each individual hospital, but this, this goes from 2012 to 2017, and you can see how uh, there's an increase in proportion of hospitals that are meeting all of these guidelines. So I think that is one of the standards of care, and this is just a um, plot of uh, uh, the same sort of thing, just showing how their practice has, has improved over this time period. So as I said at the beginning of the talk, um, we don't provide surgical care alone. We have to work as teams, both in and out of the operating room. Um, and it's pretty obvious why we need to communicate with each other. Um, information transfer and communication in surgery has been specifically studied and again found to be a common source of, of error um, and that information transfer failure uh, is very common in surgical care um, and not only can lead to errors or missteps but actually to frank patient harm. And again, they noted that the standardized communication using checklists, there's something like this called IPASS for resident handoffs which we keep trying to uh, get our residents to use at our institution and e even our staff doctors when we sign off can really uh, standardize this information um, transfer uh, that, that is necessary to occur these days and uh, again make things more safe. And that's simply because you know collective intelligence when we all talk to each other and um, are all thinking along the same things you're or smarter uh, than any of us can ever be individually. Um, this is a, a paper talking about uh, orthopedic surgeon leadership um, and again, emphasizing the importance of effective team communication, consenting patients properly, um, how we implement and use and champion uh, checklists because they really can and do work. Um, 
We uh, need to reduce distractions in the operating room. Um, and uh, again, as someone said uh, earlier, routinely collect data uh, so that we have uh, information to make informed decisions and we actually know the outcomes uh, of our patients and how we're doing with, with safety and quality of care. And uh, there's something called non-technical skills, which there's now papers on how this can be measured and you can even um, train and uh, learn this in, in the operating room and maybe something that will be rated on in the future and how you um, communicate with others. So in summary, um, I think what I've tried to convey in this talk is that uh, to improve your performance uh, individually and collectively, we need to know ourselves, we need to know how we think, and we need to know the pitfalls in our thinking. Um, we should know our results. Um, we need to do our best to keep up with literature, even if it's impossible to do. Uh, work within your system, standardized care processes to the extent you're able and utilize even something as simple as a, as a checklist, as a checklist um, because these really can uh, work, but they require you know, a deliberate implementation process. They require a lot of mentoring, but most of all, they require sort of modeling and support from uh, the more senior uh, surgeons. But this is, this is worth the effort and will benefit everyone. So thank you. Open up for questions. Anyone has questions, come to the microphone. I have a quick question. Um, in one of your earlier slides, you mentioned that a macho attitude can be counterproductive. Um, what were some of the other attitudes displayed in the operating room by orthopedic surgeons that were noted to be counterproductive? They all, they all fall on the same category, you know, but that, that's a particular one that, that's been defined, and I just found it, it interesting with, you know, the inequity historically in orthopedic surgery that it is a lot of a lot of men macho kind of goes along with that but it actually it does refer to a to a category category of thinking or, or a sort of personality of decision making that is based on over overconfidence and I'm, I'm the boss and I know what's right and and sort of this this trait that is often um, surgeons are sort of stereotypically associated with um, and it's just interesting to see that you know they can measure that and, and document that that's present in uh, um, many people in our specialty, you know, and that it can potentially, like that highway engineer <laughs> who damaged a few cars a quarter mile away, you know, we don't always understand some of the consequences of the decisions we're making or even really think about them. Yeah, I just wanted to comment on the um, process of care uh, observation um, and our experience with bundled care in, in, in total drug replacement. So we, uh, we became involved in the uh, initial CMS bundle care process because you know we felt like this was something that the company wanted to learn about it. Um, and we subsequently got out of it because it's changed over time. But the point I wanted to make um, is that we noticed when we created these processes, it was not only the patients in the bundle that benefited, but our mind was steady, went down for everyone. So um, just to illustrate the point, I'm sure that's been reproduced in many settings, but if you have a, a process for a defined group, it, it tends to bleed over broadly in other activities. Yeah, I think that's exactly correct. And you know, even with, with the, uh, the checklist, that, that's, uh, the, the, there's a lot of discussion about why are they successful. Is it just a measuring artifact, you know, where you, people know that they're doing this and they're being observed and they're just going to pay more attention and be better regardless? Or is it actually the checklist itself that's doing it? But no, I, I think Dr. Vale is exactly right because there's, there's definitely a benefit to even something as simple as standardized DVT prophylaxis, you know, so that everyone kind of, um, you can't even measure what you're doing if everyone, you know, there's 10 surgeons, for example, in my department, if all of us had an individualized approach to measuring DVT or to preventing DVT, how are we ever going to know what we're doing? <laughs> and if any one, one of us tries to look at our own cases, the end is too small to really make any inferences. So there's a lot of benefits to um, that exact phenomenon, uh, uh, just creating a standardized process, and to the extent you do it for one group, it is gonna bleed over and, and probably help, you know, really everything you do. And, you know, you start something for arthroplasty patients, the hip fracture patients will probably benefit too, and then that'll spread into the other, um, you know, trauma cases, so it's a good observation, thanks. Great, thank you so much. <laughs>